So I thought this was definitely the weakest episode so far. I wouldn't say that it was actively bad, just that the scenes didn't have adequate time to breathe. This season was supposed to be 10 episodes, but was reduced to 8 by the network. And you can feel the compression in episodes like this one. It's not a filler episode, but it is a peace-moving one. This is another episode that deals with loss and grief and the inevitable vulnerability of flesh, even for dragons. Aegon is all crispy and Rhaenys is dead. Let's set the record straight. Targaryens are not fireproof. They're just maybe a bit more heat tolerant. Danny not being burnt in Khal Drogo's funeral pyre was a one-off miracle in the books. I will not discuss the show. I have seen people cite the scene of Daemon flying through Vagar's fireball on Caraxes as some kind of inconsistency in this, but it's not. It was an already dissipating fireball and he was moving through it quickly. It would be like flicking your finger through a candle flame. Also, Caraxes' neck probably creates a wind tunnel. We see in this episode that Damon has large burn scars from getting hit with a fire arrow. We also see Aegon's extensive burns in this episode. It is notable that his face is now burnt on the same side where Aemon lost an eye, and that eye is swollen shut. Who knows if it will ever work again? Maybe they'll get matching eye patches. And it is the opposite side of where Viserys eventually lost an eye. Bela talks about her grief over not being able to go claim her niece's body, and I'm sorry, Bela, but she was squished under her large dragon that then exploded. I don't think you were going to find much of her. We did see how important finding tangible remains were to Rhaenyra's grieving process, and we heard this expressed by Rhaenys herself. It was only when I saw my daughter's mortal remains that I could begin to mourn her. Of course, this episode explores how Rhaenys was much more than just flesh. She was the legacy she left behind in her family and the impact she had on everyone. Bela carries on her legacy as a dragon rider, and Corlys built the life he had for her, and now he must find a new purpose. And of course, this episode deals with the fact that actual dragons are still flesh and can still be killed. We hear this expressed explicitly through Hugh. The people of the realm saw dragons as gods, but now they are seeing that they can be killed. Unfortunately for the hungry people of King's Landing, Melisa's head has definitely started to rot. I am curious what dragon meat would taste like. What do you think would be a good wine pairing for a filet of Melis' neck? Sound off in the comments. This episode once again explores the war's impact on the people of the city of King's Landing, and we see how their needs are ignored by those in power. Eamon's response to unrest among the small folk isn't to help them, it's to close the gates so they can't escape. Masaria is cooking up some sort of scheme to use the distress of the small folk against the Greens, but this isn't necessarily going to help them, just use them to Rhaenyra's ends. It doesn't seem like the Blacks are delivering any aid, and it is their blockade that is starving and hurting the small folk most of all. The people in the castle are fine. Instead of moldy oranges, they have spare lemons to clean their swords. We saw Otto successfully court the support of the small folk with Jaehaerys' funeral possession, but Kristen Cole does not have the same instincts. His attempt to rally the people by parading Maelys' head through the streets Super backfires. They see it as a symbol of doom, and it teaches them that dragons are not gods and can actually be killed. As you may remember in the penultimate episode of the first season, Melees burst through the floor at Aegon's coronation, killing a ton of people. So one might expect the small folk to be cheering the death of the dragon that killed their cousin, not looking on in horror. I'm genuinely not sure if the show is just trying to forget the dragon pit scene happened, but I think you can maybe make this work in the sense that since the common people saw the dragons as gods, Melee's crushing a bunch of them was seen as an act of the gods, not an act of malice. It was seen as an ill omen on the greens, not an indictment of dragons themselves. Although, the people may now reframe that and start to turn their ire on the dragons. 
This episode is not exactly subtle with its messaging on the prevailing sentiment on female rulers in Westeros. It is merely that the gentler sex heretofore has not been much privy to the strategies of battle. Experience is valuable, yes, but the Dowager Queen is a woman. The people who support her will not be led by her. They look to a man for strength. And this goes for the men of Team Black as well as Team Green. Look, a part of why I started this channel in the first place is my inherent need to respond to bad Alicent Hightower takes. If you're still here, you know that about me and you've accepted it. It frustrates me when I see people hating on Alicent for siding with the patriarchy or see her rejection from the Regency as some sort of comeuppance for betraying Rhaenyra because feminism somehow? I don't really think that's how feminism works. Alicent's decision to back her own son's claim wasn't based on thinking that a woman shouldn't rule the Seven Kingdoms. It was about doing what she thought was best for her family and upholding what she believed were Viserys' wishes. I know I've said this many times before, but Alicent had good reason to fear for the safety of her children if Rhaenyra took power and Jace followed her. I think it's the show's fault for not emphasizing this more, but it was always an important part of her character motivation. Of course, she is now reevaluating that choice since her children are most decidedly unsafe, and she has seen firsthand how unfit her two eldest sons are for power. Misogyny is at the core of this story, but it is not the point of this story. Team Black isn't the feminist side just because they're marginally more progressive. Rhaenyra's claim isn't based on women having equal rights to power, it's that she was her father's chosen successor. This conflict is not team misogyny versus team girl power, it's I am the eldest boy versus because dad said so. Rhaenyra isn't fighting for the inheritances of other women, she is fighting for her own. And it is worth noting that the women granted power on Team Black are all dragon riders. Reyna is relegated to surrogate mom duty, and Missaria is quite literally not given a seat at the table. Being a dragon rider does not exempt women from patriarchy, but it does grant one power and agency that other women do not have to subvert it. This is why it annoys me when I see people treating Rhaenyra as morally superior to Allison for going against patriarchal norms, because that was always going to be easier for Rhaenyra. Allison never tried to go against the patriarchal model until it benefited her agenda personally, but neither did Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra was in a far better position to defy social norms and her personal interests were suited by it. Allison has been intent on upholding the current system because she has to believe that the sacrifices she made for it meant something. It is also loyalty to her family, which is another huge part of Westerosi culture. This is why I dislike many of the comparisons between this show and contemporary politics. The situations don't map on at all beyond the superficial, because the entire structure of society is different. Alicent has been suffering under a patriarchal system her entire life. The fact that she accepted it nonetheless, and never tried to challenge it, and is now being completely shut out, is tragic. It doesn't make her worthy of scorn. I don't think she necessarily expected the small council to side with her. She is incredibly tense that whole scene. She had hoped for the support of Kristen and or Laris, and that came as a personal betrayal, but I think she knew they were likely going to side with Aemond. I don't think she would have been so intent on the Regency if Aemond were less Aemond. I can't say that she doesn't want power. I think she wants her experience to be seen as useful. She wants to be valued. But I think the main reason she tried to make herself regent is because she knows that her son should not be given more power. So everyone knows Aemond tried to kill his brother, right? Or they at least suspect it. Alicent clearly knows she may not be the most perceptive mother or understand her children all that well, but she is still his mother. I think she knew for sure when he couldn't maintain eye contact with her when Maester Orwile was discussing Aegon's condition. And that makes her even more desperate when she pitches herself as regent. Aemond is not playing it cool. Someone will have to rule in his stead.
He maybe thinks he is, but he is not. Is his immediate successor, Prince Haman. Agreed. It's interesting to track Allison's acknowledgement of what her son is throughout this season. They never speak publicly about it, but she does make a pointed remark about Rhaenyra seeking retribution for her son's death in the small council meeting in the first episode. However, after that, she defends his actions to Otto in private. What he did, however vicious. The priests of youth. She says something different to Rhaenyra in the Sept. Amen. You know what Eamon is? And then she says much the same to Cole in this episode. You know what he is. What he has somehow become. Allison did not see what her son was becoming until it was too late. Until he killed Luke, she was able to ignore the violence in him the same way she ignores the violence in herself. And now the Greens have no better choice than to fall in line behind Eamon. Aegon's claim to the throne is based on male primogeniture, and they have to uphold that. But all of the soldiers on that battlefield stopped battling and looked up when Vagar arrived. Maybe some of them weren't at the right angle to see, and many who were in position to see got crushed. But still, hundreds of people witnessed Aemon indiscriminately blasting his brother with fire. And even for those who weren't there, he is already a kinslayer. Why would they believe he wouldn't do it again, especially when he had so much to gain? I talked last week about how weird it was that no one in the story has called Aemon a kinslayer, and that trend continued in this episode, and he just did a second kinslaying and attempted a third. It remains bananas to me that they aren't addressing this. Aemon is historically known as Aemon One-Eyed the Kinslayer. Fire and Blood repeatedly calls him this. Team Rhaenyra sucks at propaganda because how are you not using this to your advantage? The taboo against kinslaying is a fundamental core of Westerosi morality. No man is as accursed as the kinslayer. It's a huge part of Aemon's story because once he killed Luke, he was pretty much destined to be seen as the villain no matter what. And it's a very important part of this story about an intra-family civil war. The story really needs to address this at some point. I am tentatively enjoying where they are going with Eamon's character so far this season. I love Psychos, and it seems like he's going to get way more unhinged, and I love that for him. Not so much for the people around him, but whatever this is, I am so here for it. I don't think any of this is out of character per se, but I do think they didn't quite land the character arc to get him here. Beyond ignoring the kinslaying taboo, we see Aemond is clearly upset by Luke's death at the end of the first season, and then it's barely touched upon in the second. And I don't think there is no emotion here. I don't think he has completely lost all of his humanity, just suppressed it, and put on a facade of cold monstrousness, that also lets him do the things he maybe has always wanted to do. I don't think they've lost all opportunity for depth with this character. It really depends on how they handle things going forward. Now I have a feeling that we are going to get a more introspective phase from Aemond at some point, but we really should have seen more of the fallout from Storm's End at the beginning of this season. It seemed coming out of the first season that they were making Aemond more of a Daemon parallel, someone who does deeply care for his family, even if he doesn't always treat them well. But Daemon would never have done anything to hurt Viserys. To be fair, Viserys was a much better brother than Aegon, but still. And I think it's good to highlight the differences between these two as well as their similarities. And speaking of Daemon, together the two of them have enough mommy issues to resurrect Sigmund Freud and then kill him all over again. I, for one, loved the scene where Damon fucks his mom, a show that explores the dynamics of a family where incest is normalized, if not encouraged, has to explore the psychological consequences of those boundaries being blurred. Parent-child incest has never been something the Targaryens engaged in, at least not publicly, Though Visenya and Maegor definitely gave off some vibes, if anyone was doing it, it was those two. 
And those two characters are both parallels for both Aemond and Daemon. Visenya was the elder sister and wife of Aegon the Conqueror. She was the first writer of Vagar and wielded Dark Sister, the Valyrian steel sword that Daemon now carries. Daemon was also compared to Visenya in the first episode of this show. God be good. This family already has its Visenya. Magor, Visenya's son, was a second son, but he was the superior warrior and he deemed himself more fit to inherit the crown. Damon was compared to Magor by Otto in the first episode of the show. Damon would be a second Magor, or worse. Magor also became a kinslayer when he killed his nephew, his half sibling's son, in a dragon battle that wasn't exactly a battle because his dragon was massive and the other dragon was tiny. This incident became known as the Battle Beneath the God's Eye. Now, these parallels don't mean that any of these guys actually want to fuck their moms. Damon seems horrified when he realizes who the woman in his dream is, but they are intriguing. And Eamon and Damon both have complex psychosexual issues that blur familial nurturing and carnal relationships. Damon is currently married to his niece, was previously married to his cousin and possibly in love with his brother. I am a bisexual Damon truther, but I accept that this isn't canon. Damon has always craved the love and approval of his family and been very into Targaryen exceptionalism. Of course, he's going to have a sex dream where the mother he never knew appears as some Targaryen goddess and tells him he's the world's best boy. Aemon seeks the validation and comfort he cannot get from his own mother and an older woman he also has a sexual relationship with. This relationship began when he was taken to a brothel at the age of 13, which feeds into a complex relationship with sex that is tied to maternal figures. Also, his mom is super hot. If he was into her, I get it. The Targaryen family tree isn't so much a tree as some sort of a weird tangle and it didn't get that way by people playing Parcheesi. It would be a lot more unusual if these characters weren't sexually fucked up. There isn't really such thing as a healthy, incestuous relationship, even if it's treated as normal, and this family is fundamentally poisoned at its core because of this. Keeping up with the Daemon parallels, both Daemon and Aemon assert themselves as rulers in this episode. With the death of Rhaenys and Maelys, Aemon and Vagar and Daemon and Caraxes are the two most powerful martial entities on this continent. And now that a full-scale dragon war has commenced, it would make sense that people would see them as leaders. It doesn't play out that way in the story, at least not for Daemon. The undeclared river lords defy him because of his war crimes despite his dragon. People are not afraid of Caraxes the way they're afraid of Vagar, probably because he's too adorable and everyone just wants to give him a hug. But people talk about Aemon and Vagar like the boogeyman. Kristen Cole falls behind Aemon because of what he saw at Rook's Rest. He has seen firsthand the destructive power that has now been unleashed, and he knows that he cannot fight it. Damon has to ask to be called king, but Aemon does not have to actively assert himself. The pieces are in place, such that his ascension is inevitable. And Damon moved one of those pieces himself in orchestrating the death of Jaehaerys, Aegon's other male heir who would have come before Aemon. Darren is irrelevant. Sorry, Darren. Now, Aemon was also declared regent in the book, where Aegon had a surviving son at this point, but having no one else before him in the line of succession secures his hold on power even further. And neither of them are good rulers. Aemon, I think, could have been under different circumstances, but as he is now, he is angry, reckless, and vastly overestimates his own abilities. Neither Aemon or Daemon shows any concern for the well-being of the people they seek to rule. The people of King's Landing are hungry, frightened, and fear the potential carnage of dragon warfare, and Aemon's first move is to bar the gates and trap them. Daemon casually suggests the Blackwoods commit heinous war crimes against innocent civilians. Now, I don't think that Daemon really has interest in ruling a kingdom. He definitely wants power. He wants to be treated with reverence and obeyed, 
but I don't know that he actually wants to rule. I do think some of his current kingly ambitions could be Hall or Alice River's magic that is pushing him towards a specific end, but that remains to be seen. People joke about Aemond being a Daemon fanboy, but Daemon did Aemond cosplay in his dream last week, and now he's writing Aemond fanfiction. The realm will suffer if Aemond one-eye rules. You should pray you never meet someone. They will cut you down soon as wish you good day. Also, he started wearing a leather doublet, and do you know who else wore a leather doublet first? Honestly, these two should just fly away together and make out or something. That would really be the best thing for the realm right now. Of course, then they would be Essos's problem, so maybe Sithorios. Both of you, fly to Sithorios right now. Have fun with the monsters. The question of who is fit to rule is central to this entire narrative. In a society like Westeros, and in our society today too, it is often as much about how people perceive a ruler as it is about the actual things a ruler does. If someone is perceived as lesser or other due to gender, birth status, disability, or other prejudices, that will undermine their status. I am not a monarchist. I don't believe in the idea of a rightful heir or a good king in general, but I do believe there are better kings and worse kings. Jace and Bela have both proven themselves worthy heirs thus far. In this episode, they both display keen diplomatic skills. We haven't seen enough of them to really know their values, but they both seem like decent and kind people who also have a streak of ferocity, which I do think is beneficial for a ruler of a society like this, where a ruler must project strength. At the moment, both of them seem like ideal candidates, but neither of them is a legitimate heir by Westerosi standards. There is an argument to be made that Jace is legally trueborn because Lainor, Corlys, and Viserys all publicly accepted him as such, but his true parentage is clearly visible to anyone with one or more functioning eyes. Bloodlines are very important in this world, they are foundational to the ruling order, and many people will not accept Jace as a legitimate heir on a legal technicality. This was always going to be a huge obstacle for him because his claim can be very easily disputed, especially if he is married to Bela, who makes his parentage even more obvious. And Bela is now the rightful queen if you go by absolute primogeniture, but the realm would never have accepted her as she is a woman whose claim passed through to other women. That's another thing that demonstrates that Rhaenyra's claim is not just about female inheritance. Bela and Jace ruling Westeros together is about as good an option as people could want. But unfortunately, in monarchies like this, the worthy heir is not always the rightful one. All right, now some miscellaneous observations. There is something kind of disconcerting about seeing Aemond outside in the daytime. I think it's because he's so vampire-coated. He just looks like he doesn't belong there. Another daemon Aemond parallel is having a much older woman of lower birth status, urging them to think about the lives of the common folk. And once again, in the name of power, it's the weak and the women who must endure. I would remind you only that when princes lose their temper, it is often others who suffer. A small folk. Like me. We have some pretty solid confirmation of Alice's magical abilities in this episode. The fact that she brings up Damon's mother when she does indicates that she at least knows what he is dreaming, if not controls it. It's a pity, don't you think, that you never knew your mother? This shot, where Alice disappears behind Simon, is so cool. Someone needs to save Simon Strong from Damon Targaryen. Please let that man be free of his nonsense. Vermax does a little happy dance after Jace successfully completes his mission, and it's very cute. I have seen people bemoaning the lack of humor in this show compared to Game of Thrones, but I think House of the Dragon is so much funnier. Damon asking a child he just met to smother his granddad with a pillow 
is so much funnier to me than any Tyrion quip or dick joke. We hear that Damon was rejected by his mother's dragon. Maylee said, bad bitches only. Why does Reyna's family hate her? I feel so bad. Compare the way Rhaenyra talks to Reyna with the way she talks to Bela. And Corlys rejects Reyna as his heir, but he asks Bela, and Reyna got rejected by a dragon? I like you, Reyna. I believe in you. Also, still no one has told us where Vagar lives. I really need to know where Vagar lives. This is very important to me. All right, that is it. Thank you so much for watching until the end. Like and subscribe, etc. Thank you. Bye. What would you call the husband of the queen? Well, the king. There it is then. Consort.